Chapter 6 uh, by talking about viscous flows and the Navier Stokes equations. Uh, but this is, a, this is a fun section because this allows us to finally start taking um, all those little, you know, the special types of uh, velocity potentials that we talked about on Wednesday, those being a source, a sink, a vortex, and a doublet, and start stacking those on top of each other to make different flows of actual, real, practical interest. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today are four um, four types. Well, I guess I only listed as three here. Uh, what we call the Rankine half body, which we make by combining a source with a uniform stream, a Rankine oval, a source and a sink in a uniform stream, and then a circular cylinder, which is what happens when you put a doublet in a uniform stream. And then I've added on there also uh, a rotating cylinder, which is what happens when you take this and you put a vortex at the middle of it, a free vortex. Um, and we'll see that that's actually one of the ways we begin to uh, approximate the generation of lift. Uh, so, uh, just to summarize, we'll be coming back to this periodically, but uh, our, our, our basic plane potential flows that we talked about, um, remember each of these proposed values of phi, or these stream functions, psi, satisfy the governing Laplace equation. And it's really a matter of convenience which we choose to use. Right? Um, we've derived these both under the same set of assumptions. Remember the velocity potential, um, by default, satisfies irrotationality, and we added a constraint of uh, 
uh, incompressible conservation of mass in order to get this. And the stream function satisfies incompressible conservation of mass implicitly. And we add the additional constraint of irrotationality and come up with the same governing equation. So these two uh, will satisfy the, condition, the same sets of conditions. We can use either one, which is why we have alternative expressions for each type of flow that uh, uh, express, you know, for example, um, a source or a sink uh, with either a velocity potential or a stream function. And remember also that uh, lines of constant psi here indicate streamlines, whereas lines of constant phi are what we call equipotential lines. And the two of them are always orthogonal to one another, which is why, for example, the streamlines of a source or a sink, ones that radiate outward, right? Um, or sorry, the, the streamlines of a source or sink that radiate outward uh, look a whole lot like the equipotential lines of a free vortex. So, uh, the, I had talked about this before, but the real key is that these are both linear partial differential <coughs> equations. That is, the fact that if we, you know, the fact that um, this is a linear operator here means that if we have any number of uh, individual velocity potentials, you know, phi1, phi2, phi3, so on, so on, so forth. We can combine any number of these multiplied by any uh, coefficients and plug them in here and we'll still get something that satisfies the governing equation. The same goes for our stream function psi. <coughs> so the idea here is that because flow does not cross streamlines, right, we can use streamlines to approximate solid boundaries of objects. And then because we have all of these functions that allow us to kind of manipulate the streamlines of a flow, uh, we can stack these on in different ways. It's sort of, uh, think of it like a, a Lego analogy, if you want. Uh, we can take all of these building blocks of uh, velocity potentials and stream functions and stack them on top of each other, multiply them by different coefficients, um, and be guaranteed that we'll still get something that satisfies the governing equation but at the same time, something that allows us to kind of manipulate the streamlines to represent some body, uh, solid boundary that we're interested in uh, evaluating the flow around. So, uh, first things first, uh, the Rankine half body. All right, so the Rankine half body is what we get by combining a source and a uniform flow. So um, we're going to be jumping around between uh, stream functions and velocity potentials, but uh, where it's practicable, I'll try to give both of them. Um, so uh, the first thing to note is, uh, well, in both cases, we get you know psi of the Rankine half body it can be uh, expressed as just the sum of psi uniform flow and psi of the source. Uh, note that before. Previously, we used uh, Cartesian coordinates to express the functions for uniform flow, and we used uh, polar or cylindrical coordinates to express sources, sinks, vortices, etc. Um, you know, that was fine. That was a matter of convenience. We picked whichever one happened to suit the type of flow best. But once we start adding them up together, we have to be um, we have to pick a coordinate system and remain uh, consistent. So uh, remember that. For example, um, for a uniform flow, <coughs> si or phi was equal to um, ux plus vy. Putting this into uh, polar coordinates simply requires that we write it out as, for example, uh, x now is equal to, or x is going to be equal to r cosine theta, y is going to be r sine theta, r can be expressed by the square root of x squared plus y squared, and theta is arctangent y over x. So we can use these expressions to uh, 
you know, just plug in things. So for example, um, we also had psi here was equal to uh, uy minus vx. So for the uniform flow, we can see that for uy, we just plugged in r sine theta to put the uniform flow into polar coordinates. For the potential function, we just plugged in uh, r cosine theta for x here. But um, it shouldn't be, you know, you've, you've worked with polar coordinates before. Uh, all right, so first, like, what, what does this actually look like? What does the Rankine half body appear to be? Uh, and how does it appear? And this is this is the video we sh I showed on Wednesday that shows a physical uniform flow with the physical anal analog to a, uh, a a source flow. And what we can see is that it develops this sort of stagnating behavior here with the streamlines that run around um, what appear to be this body that just keeps on going downstream. <clears throat> so first thing we're going to do is try to figure out where this stagnation point occurs. So if we've got a uniform flow coming in this <coughs> way and we have a source here, then it makes sense to imagine that somehow some point between, you know, neg or negative infinity and the point of the source, there's going to be uh, a location where the flows stagnate against one another. So in order to find the stagnation point, what we do is we say, all right, we expect that this is going to happen along the negative ax x axis or an angular uh, position of pi, right? And we're going to solve for the value of r that results in a radial velocity equal to zero. So uh, the radial velocity, remember, uh, for if we're, we're, we're working the uh, stream function for right now, uh, the radial velocity we get is 1 over r d psi d theta. So we just take this expression for psi, differentiate with respect to uh, theta, and divide by r. And what we get in doing so Theta, that's going to give us 1 over r u r cosine theta plus m over 2 pi dividing by r we're going to end up with u cosine theta plus m over 2 pi r and um, so if we want to evaluate this at uh, an angle of pi, that is along the negative x, x axis, plug in pi here, and what we end up with is negative u plus m over 2 pi r. And we're trying to find the, the radial distance from the source at which this is equal to zero. Which gives us then that, uh, so for r here, we're going to plug in some value, we'll call it b. And b, we'll say, is the distance from the source to the stagnation point. And solving for b gets us, well, it's written up here. Um, solving for b will get us a value of m over 2 pi u. So as a function of the flow rate and the strength of the source, we can calculate the sort of the upstream location of the uh, the stagnation point created by the source. Alright, so, um, so we have the stagnation point established. Now we know that the stagnation point is, well, so we, we, we recognize that the stagnation point has to be on the, uh, this imaginary body surface that we're, we're sort of emulating here, right? If we have a physical body, you know, the stagnation point has to occur somewhere on the surface. So if we figure out what the streamline is that passes through that stagnation point, we can assume that that streamline represents the streamline represent, uh, the, uh, the outline of the surface that we're interested in. In this case, this ranking half body. So if we plug in 
Um, you know, if we plug in a location of uh, R equals, um, what is it, U over, sorry, M over 2 pi U. M over 2 pi U theta equals pi. If we plug these values into our expression for psi, then what falls out is we get a psi uh, that passes through the stagnation point of m over 2. So this is a constant as a function of the strength of the source. Well, this is, um, this is useful now because, remember, uh, any constant, any line along which psi is constant describes a streamline. So if we follow this constant streamline, what we get is the outline of the body. Um, as another sort of, uh, it, it's another kind of um, subtlety that uh, if we want, remember the, um, that when you're deriving uh, the velocity potentials or the stream functions uh, from from uh, velocity distributions, <coughs> what we usually say is, you know, there's, a, there's some sort of constant here in the end. And it's easiest to assume this constant is equal to zero, remember. Um, because it doesn't really matter. The constant just shifts what values are assigned to which streamlines. Uh, but just for the sake of convenience, it may be easiest in this case to say, well, let's mm -hmm. let this constant then be equal to m over 2, right? So that the body of our streamline, or the body of our, uh, uh, the, the, the solid boundary that we're interested in is now given by ur sine theta plus m over 2 pi is equal to 0. That is uh, our stream function. Uh, setting it equal to zero represents the location of the body boundary. Um, and to sort of show what this looks like, let's see if I can pull it up. All right. So, um, I have this uh, MATLAB script again that just calculates, you know, I plug in a value of m, plug in a value of u, and it computes the stream function at, over a big domain and then draws contours of constant psi through it. And uh, by doing that, for the case of a source in a uniform flow, what we get is something that looks like this. Right. So uh, what I've done here is I've said, I've done exactly this, I've said, well, you know, I can shift the stream function up or down, it doesn't really matter, I'll just shift it by m over 2 such that this dark black line here is uh, equal to a stream function value of 0. And what this allows us to do is, we, uh, is sort of visualize what the entire flow field Uh, what this allows us to do is visualize what the whole flow field looks around uh, this, you know, what we could imagine is, is a sort of physical uh, looking body um, where we have the stagnation point here. I plugged in a value of, uh, let's see, I went for a stagnation point that's one unit upstream from the source, so we can see that the source would be located right here at the origin, and the stagnation point occurs at a x-coordinate of negative one. Alright. 
So the next thing we try to look at is we can say, all right, we know where the stagnation point is. We know how to describe the stagnation streamline. Uh, we can go ahead and plug in some different values. For example, we know that this m over 2, it's a constant here, is equal to by the computation of the streamline, or the uh, stagnation point, remember we got that stagnation point is located at b equals m over 2 pi u. So we can make some substitutions here and say, well, now we can write m as a function of b and plug that in so we can rewrite our, stake, our stream, body streamline uh, or the, the general streamline now as uh, a function of b, sort of the, the distance upstream at which the stagnation point occurs, um, instead of a function of the source strength. Okay, uh, so then to the last sort of geometric consideration we want to consider here is uh, how wide is the body? And so what we do is we, we refer to this distance um, from the x-axis to the widest point of the body as the body's half width. And the way we get this is by taking the limit of, uh, well, we, we write this out as a function of, um, let's see, We take our stagnation streamline here, and we can write this out plugging in instead. Uh, we can write this out in terms of x and y, and take the limit as x approaches infinity or as uh, theta approaches zero, right? Something that says at an infinite distance down the x axis what is going to be the extent of this body. And by doing that, uh, taking that limit, what we come up with is a body half width of equal to pi b. So if this is pi, this is pi b. And so we can see that the entire geometry of the problem is defined by three things. The flow, the inflow, right? right? The uh, the width or the, the distance upstream of the stagnation point and the strength of the source. And by going through these geometric considerations, we've shown that, in fact, the relationship between the flow rate and the strength of the source can be completely constrained by our desired body geometry. So all we have to do is dial in a value of b, say how big do we want the body to be, and we get a, um, for a given, and for a given flow rate, we enter a value b and we get a source strength necessary to achieve that size body. So if I pull that MATLAB script back up. So you can see up here I have my two uh, parameters that I enter. One is b and one is u. So if I wanted to get all this thing to be, uh, for the stagnation point to occur at an x location of negative 3, we can expect that the body half width then will be pi times 3. We'll get um, simulating flow is now a much wider body, and we can see that the stagnation point occurs right here. This is zero, this is negative five. So we have complete control over what the stream, the flow field looks like just with these two numbers. Um, the ranking half body is, is a really useful flow for simulating the flow around uh, kind of the front end of something, right? For example, uh, pilings. Uh, this kind of looks like what we might call an ogive, uh, which is a bullet-like geometry that might be the front end of a uh, Torpedo or an AUV, what have you. But one of the things we have to consider here is that uh, the half body extends an infinite distance downstream, right? It's completely open at this end. So it's not that useful for things where we need to simulate the, the, the flow around the back end of a body because there isn't any back end. Um, a few other things to note. 
Remember, I talked about how sources, sinks, vortices, etc., are what we call mathematical singularities. That is, they're completely undefined at the point where they're located. They violate the assumptions that allow us to assume potential flow. Um, but this is an example of how that is okay. We don't care. Uh, because we're only interested in the flow outside of the body here, right? All of this stuff that's going on inside the body is kind of, say, discount it as sort of imaginary, including the singularity itself. So with the Rankine half body, we see that the singularity is located inside of our imagined solid boundary. So the flow field never touches it. We don't have to get close enough to it to worry about it violating our, uh, our assumptions of potential flow. So to reiterate, Everywhere that we're interested in the actual fluid flow field, which is outside of this black boundary here, um, our conservation of mass, our irrotational assumptions, those are okay. It's only if we, for some reason, said we wanted to look at the flow inside of this body, which doesn't actually happen, you know, by our kind of reckoning. All right, so, um, so we have the body half width. The question now is, uh, what, do we, you know, what do we do with this? Well, what we've done is we've defined psi everywhere in the flow. And if we wanted to, you know, it'd be easy enough to, uh, to plug in values and get the, uh, the potential flow everywhere here also, the value of phi. Um, we're going to tend to be relying on psi today just because it's nicer for visualizing streamlines. But understand that the same processes apply for um, for coming up with values of the, the velocity potential. Um, but what this allows us to do is, we, so we have a value of psi that is known everywhere in the flow field. Anywhere where we plug in coordinates, um, we can get a stream function. And we have the relationship that says, vr is equal to, uh, to 1 over r d psi d theta and v theta is equal to negative d psi dr. So just by taking the respective derivatives of this function, we can get the velocities everywhere in the field, right? And what are the velocities used for? Well, what if we wanted to calculate pressures, right? We're dealing with an irrotational flow, in viscid, two-dimensional. So if we know the conditions up here, upstream, that is the inflow velocity, if we assume we know the pressure upstream, then what can we apply between some point up here where we know the conditions and any point down here? The irrotational Bernoulli equation, right? If we know the velocities, we can take these two, we can say that the velocity squared is simply equal to vr squared plus v theta squared. We know both of these values everywhere. So we can come up with v squared everywhere. We can say that p naught plus uh, rho over 2 u naught squared is equal to p plus rho over 2 v squared, where u naught and p naught are the conditions upstream. So this gives us all the quantities we need to compute the pressures down here in the, you know, at any point around the body. Um, so this is really useful because now we're starting to actually get real actionable um, forces on something like this. So for example, if we did that on this body, what we would see is that there's a stagnation point right here, and all the pressures tend to rise right here. And then if we integrated the pressures around the body, we would see that what we get is a resulting drag force on this. We'll get into this a little bit more on the other, um, the other canonical flows, but... Uh, Okay, so um, 
kind of summarize that. Um, so for this type of flow, we want to note that, uh, as I said, this is a, 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 an example that provides some useful information about so it's like the extreme front end of a realistic thing, sort of a bridge piling or a, or a strut that's in a uniform stream. Um, but it doesn't give us more very much information about what happens at the back end of a real body because it's a semi-infinite half body. You don't, you know, it never stops. Um, this is an important one. Remember that we're dealing with potential flow, inviscid assumption, which means that at the boundary there, at the streamlines that represent the solid boundary, uh, we actually have a velocity, which means we're saying that viscosity here doesn't exist. In a realistic flow, remember, the fluid is going to stick to any solid boundary we have, and the velocity is going to be zero as a result of viscosity. So um, potential flows like this don't capture the viscous effects, and they do not capture uh, the flow right at the solid boundary very well. Now, so, you know, what that's going to mean for us is that if we're looking at, uh, you know, a flow that looks like this, in real life, if we had some body that looked like this, we would have a boundary layer that develops along the edge here. Luckily for us, those boundary layers tend to be very thin compared to the bodies that they develop on, and so potential flow, at least for uh, rough approximations, is it, it's fairly okay that we assume that the velocity here is non-zero. Okay. Moving on, next one that we cover is what we call the Rankine Oval. So um, if the Rankine half body is what happens when we shove a source into a uniform flow, uh, the ranking oval is what happens if we put in a sink uh, of equal strength. There we go. So, shown here is uh, or what this looks like. We have a uniform flow, and we have a source and a sink located at some distance uh, each of A from the origin of our coordinate system. Uh, what we do then is we say, okay, well, we know, again, we know the potential and uh, stream functions of a source, of a sink, of a uniform flow, so we just add them all up. And what we end up getting is uh, shown here where this is the, again, this is the uniform flow. Uh, and then this is the, uh, the stream function for the combination of a source and a sink. Um, this actual uh, expression results from some trigonometric identities, but um, the, the potential flow function is a little bit easier to work with. So uh, if we're looking at the potential flow function, again, u r cosine theta, we can see by inspection that that's just equal to u x. So this is our uh, uniform flow. m over 2 pi ln of r is our uh, uh, velocity potential for either a source or a sink, depending on the sign of m. And so by assigning a positive m to this one and negative m to this one, and then respective r1 and r2, we can write that the velocity potential evaluated at some point is a, uh, a sum of these two values with the sign switch here to represent having a negative m. So again, yeah, these two things are really equivalent. Um, this just has orthogonality to the function below it. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, if you remember on Wednesday, we talked about how this it starts to look a lot like what we call doublet, right, where you had a uh, a source and a sink of equal strength located at some small distance from one another. And it was the derivation of the doublet that actually led us to this expression right here. Um, the difference is that in a doublet, and we'll see that in a minute, uh, we allow a to approach zero. And so we take the limit of this expression as a approaches zero to get our value of uh, psi. In this case, we don't have to worry, we don't have to do that. You know, we, we have to, uh, 
we don't have to concern ourselves with taking any limits. We can just allow a to be some finite number. So uh, let's see. I'm just going through the process to arrive at this expression here. So we're taking the, uh, the stream functions for the uniform flow, for a sink and a source, uh, combining them here to get one, two, and then by some trigonometric identity where we take the tangent of both sides and uh, manipulate stuff, take the inverse tangent, we get equal to u r sine theta minus m over 2 pi tangent negative 1 2 a r sine theta r squared minus a squared. Okay, um, so the stream function, um, go ahead and grab a chunk of paper and uh, try writing this out now in Cartesian coordinates, translating the from the polar coordinates we're dealing with here into x and y. All right, so we're going to take a minute to do that. Okay, you want to have an expression in terms of x and y for a stream function? Ui minus 
Y minus. Uh, yeah, this stuff's all gonna stay the same. All right. Two a y over x squared plus y squared minus a squared. Good. Exactly. All right. So, um, fortunately, we have to kind of zip through the the derivations of this, but. Um, what we see is that, uh, all right, if we were to plug in, in, we could use this either, we could do this either in radial or Cartesian coordinates. Uh, it's really our choice. The idea is um, if we pick uh, either y equals zero and solve for the x at which our velocity is equal to zero, or we pick um, the angular location to be pi and solve for the upstream location of the stagnation point, what we're going to come up with is that from some distance l from our uh, origin here, right? The origin's here, source is located A, some up distance further than that is L, the stagnation point. Um, then what we actually get is, I want to correct this, what we actually get is L squared is equal to this quantity, which means that L can actually be positive, negative, this quantity here. So what this tells us is we actually have two stagnation points. We have one upstream and we have one downstream. Uh, and the points, the locations of the stagnation point are uh, functions of the strength of our source and sink, the distance from which they're located, the distance away from which from each other, which they're located, and our free stream velocity u. Uh, the body half width, that is. The, the, the width h of this at its widest point is this really nasty expression here, which we can't actually solve directly. Right? This is a, a nonlinear equation, so the only way to go get this is to um, effectively do it by trial and error, to guess, to look at, to plug in a value h here and see if you get the same value h out, <coughs> if not to adjust your guess. Um, what we can do, though, is we could specify a desired value of h and calculate a value of a that's required to get that. But the idea here is that we have, you know, we just have uh, uh, the entire problem is constrained by h, by a, by m, and by u, uh, and by l. And what we're able to do is by say, taking this and this, we can knock out two of these uh, as unknowns and turn it into a function of any three of these variables. Okay, so uh, in the same vein, we go, uh, add another MATLAB <coughs> script that does Rankine oval. Once again, we see, so in this case, uh, I just plugged in a value of m and u, and what we get out is kind of a, uh, the functions of half body widths and, and half body lengths uh, that are functions of those respective values. Uh, but again, we see this is a much more useful flow than the Rankine half body because now what we have is flow around the tail end of this thing. Okay, so this could be thought of as, and you can stretch this out, you can make it wider, you can do whatever you want with it uh, using the H-A-M-U-L uh, uh, parameters to the flow, but we could use this to, for example, simulate things like the flow around the body of a submarine. Okay. next item of interest is what happens if we let the ranking oval case, you know, the A, the distance, the source and sink from one another, approach zero. 
then what we get by um, what we talked about on Wednesday is if we take a source and sink, sink equals strength, let them smash together, what we get is what we call a doublet, right? And the doublet uh, stream function was given as negative k sine theta, where k is defined as the strength of the doublet or the potential flow, k cosine theta over r. Um, and what we get then is, uh, so again, if we say, all right, let's find a stagnation point, let's find the location, or let's find the location of the stagnation point, let's find the value of our stream function that passes through that stagnation point, right? Um, then what we get is that psi is equal to zero at the stagnation point. We let the value of r at which the stagnation point occurs be equal to the radius a, and uh, what we end up getting is a flow that looks like that around a cylinder. So. What we've done is we've said, all right, we're going to find the stagnation point here. We know at this point that VR is equal to zero. If we know that this location occurs at, at R equals A, and we find that everywhere along the boundary of this, psi is equal to zero, what we can do is we can plot out the outline of a cylindrical section The, the, the width of which, the geometry of which we define as a function of A. So, um, can I move this? Uh, whatever. Um, anyway, so we can see that if we make these substitutions, what we end up with is the stream function can be written out as a function of just the upstream velocity and uh, the radius of the circle, along with, you know, our coordinates r and theta. But uh, so, for example, if I plugged in, in this case, I plugged in a, a equals 1, uh, and u, I don't remember what I let u be, but it's uh, pretty arbitrary at this point. And what we see is that we end up with a circle, circle of radius 1. All right, and the flow inside the circle, again, isn't really of interest. We don't care what's happening inside as long as we get a streamline that represents the body that we're interested in simulating. Um, but we can see again that because we have two singularities here, we have a source and we have a sink, there's flow coming out of one and into the other. And because both singularities are contained within the solid circular, you know, analog uh, here, we don't have to worry about the fact that they are actually mathematically singular. All right, uh, now, Playing with, uh, all right, so um, we're not actually going to have time to, to sketch any velocities here, but what we can do is if we plug in a value of r, uh, r equals a, into our expression for velocities, we get that the radial velocity at this uh, at the boundary here is going to be what at this point? What do we you know? What do you think the radial velocity component is equal to? Zero, identically, right? Everywhere on the body, because the radial velocity tells us what the flow normal to the, uh, you know the uh, equipotential line here is, and we end up with zero. Um, but we end up with an angular velocity that looks like this. So, uh, two takeaways here is that uh, the maximum velocity in the flow then is going to be is going to occur where sine theta is maximized, which is at theta equals pi over two and negative pi over two here and here. And at those lo those locations, we can see that the velocity, the magnitude of the velocity, is going to be equal to twice the free stream velocity. 
So what that tells us is that free stream velocity comes in at some magnitude u. It stops at the stagnation point. It goes to zero. And the stuff that goes around the outside here speeds up, speeds up, speeds up, hits its twice its original magnitude here, and then it's going to come around here and if we believe this, then go back to zero at this point again. So we have stagnation points here and here, and our streamline is going to go zero velocity. This one's going to go from one times its upstream component, two times its upstream component, and back down to one times its upstream component, and continue on downstream. So using this knowledge then, right, um, Okay, and we can see this little uh, visualization of what flow around a cylinder looks like at very low speeds. Um, but using this knowledge about the velocity distribution, we can again apply the Bernoulli equation, right? We can say that uh, P naught plus one half rho u naught squared, where we'll call this u naught, is equal to P s, pressure on the surface, plus one half rho v theta squared, which is equal to es plus one half rho four u naught sine squared theta. And this in turn tells us that pressure on the surface is equal to pressure upstream plus one half oops, rho u. This should be squared, shouldn't it? Yeah. Um, rho u squared, one minus four sine squared theta. Which tells us, uh, yep, yeah, it's written up there, uh, which tells us actually incorrectly that um, that the pressure distribution about this thing is going to be symmetric. That What that tells us is that the pressure is maximum here, and a maximum here, and a minimum here and here. Uh, so if we were to do these integrals, right, to calculate the force in x and the force in y, what we get is actually a value of zero for both of these. Um, because, again, the symmetry, if we integrate from um, you know, zero to two pi, then this sine squared theta is going to disappear. So this is what we call d'Alembert's paradox. Uh, it suggests that if you put, come up with a mathematical model of flow around a cylinder, you know, you put a, a, c a cylinder into a flow, we know just from, from clear observation that the drag on that thing is not going to be zero. But the mathematical model of that tells us that it is always zero. So uh, this was uh, this this sort of paradoxical statement of the math and physics was uh, expressed first by De Alembert um, and said, you know, how does how does this actually happen? And the last thing I want to highlight before we leave here is that this is an example of where potential flow kind of fails us. Um, so this is the pressure distribution predicted by potential flow. All right, this theoretically inviscid flow. Um, whereas in experiments, we get something that looks a lot like this at the forebody of our cylinder, but um, we get this kind of drop-off of our pressures as a result of viscosity. In other words, if we think of pressure as being like potential energy, uh, the boundary layer starts to rob some of that potential energy and kinetic energy from the flow. This drop in pressure happens when we start trading out potential energy, high pressure, high potential energy, low pressure, high kinetic energy, the boundary layer starts robbing some of that kinetic energy from the flow, turning it into heat, and then there's not enough kinetic energy to recover as potential energy. And so what you end up doing is you have this, this uh, separated flow region, which creates an asymmetric distribution of pressures between the front and the back, and resulting drag. Potential flow can't predict this for us. This is only something you get if you have viscous flow analysis. Um, and it'll actually be, it's one of the problems on the homework to, uh, to see what happens if you assume potential flow over the front of a body and assume a constant pressure over the back of the body and see if you actually get a drag. Um, so, well, came up a little short of the overall goal today, but um, 
It's kind of a dry topic. <laughs>